Hey guys, I am Caleb with Nebraska Farm Boy. Thanks for joining me on another edition of Farm Boy in 30 Minutes. I hope you all are doing as well as I am. I know I'm doing very well. It's another beautiful day here, home on the range. Of course, all you see behind me is a wooden wall, so you wouldn't know, but believe me, it's a beautiful day. Uh, just got done butchering up a half a beef. Uh, that is, I cut up half a beef. It, it would be cruel to butcher up half a beef. You always butcher up a whole beef, you know. <laughs> It'd be wasteful at any rate. Anyways, no, we'll be cutting up the other half tomorrow. No, no waste of half the beef, or, or there's no half a beef running around our place. Don't worry, okay? I know you were worried there for a second. Anyways, after that, I went for a walk with the family. Uh, we walked down to the fishing pond. All the kids are still down there having a great time going fishing. However, I left because, to be honest, I didn't want to get stuck all day uh, taking fish off of hooks, and it wasn't an utter dereliction of duty. My brother was down there. He can take care of it. I just wasn't going to do that today. Anyways, it's okay. Uh, it's all good. I, I, I know. Maybe I, maybe I earned the Bad Brother of the Year award, but it's okay. Anyways, to what I wanted to talk about today, uh, the question I wanted to tackle today was, is the Bible sufficient for being the basis for all of our morals? And I mean all of our morals. I don't mean just some of them. I mean, do we need to go to uh, other sources, or, or do we need to, you know, twist the Bible a little bit because it's outdated, or, or is the Bible sufficient? You know, and this is a question that a lot of people have been asking for the last, I don't know, 2,000 years since the Bible was, you know, uh, it was first uh, put together in its entirety, you know? And in short, I'll give you the spoil alert. The answer, I believe, is yes. And... I'm not just going to just going to say that because I believe that every Christian needs to have an informed faith. He needs to be able to make a logical plea for his faith. He might, needs to be able to have a defense for the hope that is within him. You know, faith is by nature a belief in things unseen. However, well, yes, it is a belief in things unseen. I've never seen God. I've never, uh, you know, a lot of his promises are are as of yet unfulfilled. But I believe that they will be fulfilled because. I don't believe in a God of a random chance, a God of, of disorder, a, an illogical God. The God I believe in is someone that is a, a personal God that I see that I see every day. You know, I see in his creation, I see in his word. I, I see his word is infallible and it hasn't been proved wrong in the last 2,000 years and nobody's going to do it. You know, it, nobody's going to do it after that, uh, after... Uh, you know, but what, what I mean to say is nobody's going to come in and uh, and disprove it because, you know, it's infallible. It is the truly uh, inspired word of God. And so, uh, I guess, in order for you to trust the Bible for all your moral standards, for all of your ethical, and, uh, you know, uh, for all your beliefs, and, and as your standard for truth, I guess you first have to believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. And personally, I don't see... I, there's, no, there's no problem for me uh, doing that because... Because, again, it, it, it's not that hard to believe in the inerrancy of a book that has never been proved wrong over 2,000 years, okay? So, for all of that, you know, for all of that, first we have to lay the foundation, you know. Do you believe in the inerrancy of Scripture? And, you know, the thing is that w if you don't, if you refuse to accept this, there is an alternative. And that's what we see, our, you know, all around us, all the time. You know, people have their own version of the truth. They don't, they don't want anybody to tell them what they're going to do. They can, they can come up with their own version of the truth. And, you know, they take a little bit from here, a little bit from there, you know, a little bit from Indian religion, a little bit from, from God, a little bit from, uh, a little bit from their dog, their neighbor, and, you know, all that great stuff. No, uh, you know, and they mix this together, and, you know, they just kind of, you know, have their moral standard, you know, uh, you, you, you don't kill people, you're nice to animals, and uh, you uh, give money to charitable organizations, you know, and you don't offend people, you're always nice to people, all right? The problem with that is that when you establish your own moral standard, you've done just that. You've established your own moral standard, which means that you have no basis for that. You are the ultimate truth. You are the ultimate source of authority, which means that you have nothing to stand on. Nothing. So basically, it's kind of like if I was trying to get navigate a big city, and I'm not good at this, okay? I was trying to navigate a big city, so I didn't know where I was going, so I asked myself where I was going. You know, it doesn't work. 
It doesn't work that way. You need something outside of you, something bigger than you, to establish your ultimate source of authority. Okay, so that's my that's my uh, defense for the need for the Bible as the ultimate source of authority. You know, whether you can come to a point uh, that you can trust the Bible as the ultimate source of authority is something that is between you and God because a lot of people want to push, want to push a decision. They want to push, they want to say, uh, you know, they want to explain in 30 seconds that the Bible is the inerrant scripture and that you should believe in Jesus and because Jesus died for our sins and now if you believe in Jesus we can now uh, uh, go to heaven. I don't think I even did that in 30 seconds. You know, and they want you to, they want you to, you know, today is the day of salvation. Don't, don't wait. And I don't believe you should wait. I believe that you should get down and study hard and think through this hard and wrestle through this hard. Because again, we cannot have a blind faith. We cannot have an uh, uninformed faith. Because an uninformed faith is an empty faith and it's not the, it's not, it's not biblical faith, okay? Because in order to believe and to believe in Jesus Christ, in order to believe in the God of the Bible, you must understand him. Because if you don't understand him, you believe in something besides him. And that is very dangerous. That is idolatry. Okay. So, so if you don't believe in the inerrancy of scripture, or, or, or more importantly, if you haven't quite come to a point where you can be settled in your mind about the inerrancy of scripture, then I would advise the first thing you need to do is you need to get in your Bible and start reading the Bible and and studying through the Bible and listening to sermons by solid preachers, uh, you know, not just not just you know what's on TV, but listening to solid t preachers who are going to go verse by verse through the Bible, who hold themselves to the standard of the Bible and explain the Bible. Okay, that's what I would advise you to do first. Uh, you could also use you could also use the outside sources like books and 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 whatnot. I, I would advise you to do that, and if you do that, and if you truly do that. I am 100% confident that you will not be let down in the in the sufficiency and in the inerrancy and in the uh, in, in the uh, inability to be shaken, shakenness. That's not that's not a word. The inability for it to be shaken. All right, the the Bible cannot be shaken. The Bible is inerrant. The Bible is sufficient. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, I, I believe that if you honestly, with a with a honest conviction and honest search. For truth, if you go to the Bible with that uh, as your as your uh, presupposition, I believe that you will not be ashamed of the of the gospel. Okay, so I believe that. However, for some of us, we read the Bible, we believe the Bible, but we actually don't read it in the right way, and we actually don't have the right beliefs about the Bible. And I think that. Part of that is, you know, none of us are ever going to be perfect. We're all going to have disagreement, uh, disagreements over the Bible. We're not always going to, we're not always going to agree. And you know, part and part of that's okay because, you know, we aren't going to be perfect until until we reach, you know, heaven. So, part of that's okay. But I think we should always be striving to understand the Bible better because, you know, if you don't have that proper that that. Uh, that firm understanding of the Bible, you're going to start sliding, and eventually you're going to start questioning your faith. You know, you just you just cannot have a blind faith. So, there's a couple of traps that I feel like we could, that is easy to fall into when you're reading the Bible, that will result in an improper reading of the Bible, and if we don't correct these, uh, these traps, then we're not going to be able to use the Bible to establish our morals, because we don't really understand how to read the Bible. So I think the first presupposition we need to come to the Bible with is that the Bible is not a mystery. The Bible was not written so that scholars and theologians are the only ones who can understand it. No, the Bible was inspired by God, but it was written by common men. It was written by common men in a common way for common people. You know, it was it was it wasn't written to the scribes and the Pharisees. None of it was. You know, they're condemned in uh, in the Bible. However. It was, it was written to the common man. That does not mean that the Bible is simple and that the Bible should, that you should take a verse, okay, take a verse and read it at face value and then walk away with that and think that now you understand the Bible, okay? Because you have to read the Bible in its entirety in its context. Okay, so let's go over a couple of, you know, common pitfalls that we can fall into uh, when we are reading the Bible. And b b before I do that, I do want to mention that I got a question. Uh, 
here a couple weeks ago. Uh, it was from a friend, and uh, he I was asking, how can a Christian use violence when the Bible clearly says that, you know, we are to be harmless as doves? Now, I go with the ESV translation, it says innocent as doves. I think there is a little bit of importance in the word, but whichever you go with, um, I, I want to use this question as kind of the backdrop for kind of what I'm going to be discussing here. Okay, because at first glance, it looks like there's a contradiction because you all know that uh, I believe that there's times that Christians should use violence. That's pretty clear, right? However, how do we how do we reconcile this with this verse? Okay, so let's start reading through a couple of these common traps that I believe that we can fall into, and, and I'm going to start. I'm going to bring this back to this question, and I'm going to use this question as an example of of how we sh of one how we can fall into these traps and two how we should avoid these traps and by the way this is a very well this is a um, very good question I'm not this friend of mine was not at all saying that he was not at all trying to pit his understanding against the Bible he was just trying to you know to uh, you know to uh, stretch me, to grow me, to, uh, to, you know, force me outside of my comfort zone here. And he did. So it was very good. It was a very good question. All right. So the first trap that I feel like we can fall into is reading our ideas and beliefs into the Bible instead of applying the Bible to our ideas and beliefs. Okay. So a lot of this comes from, you know, you are in a way a product of your environment. You're not really because you have the choice to, uh, overcome, rise above your environment, but, you know, a, we are in a sense a product of our environment. So, you know, just kind of think about your environment, you know, the world you live in, the fallen world that you live in. If you're a product of that, do you think that you naturally have all the correct answers, all the correct morals, all the correct ideas, as opposed to the Bible? Obviously not, since uh, if you believe in the, uh, in the, uh, the fallen nature of man, then you, you know, you're forced to believe that, you know, you're, you're not, you're not perfect, your heart, your heart is deceitfully wicked above all else, and who can know it? Okay, so, but that, but that's the problem. A lot of people come to the Bible with these ideas. Okay, so, in this question, we have an idea, and that is that violence is, uh, we have a preconceived notion that violence is acceptable to use in certain cases. Okay, and now we have a verse, and the verse is, you know, problematic, which is good. We should, we should, we should be, uh, you know, we should be up, we should be uh, comparing our ideas to the Bible. And in this case, we seem to have a problem. However, the, the real problem here lies in another trap that we can fall into when we're reading the Bible, and that is an assumption about words. Okay, so here we have an assumption that when Jesus was talking to the 12 disciples and he told them that he was sending them out into the midst, uh, as sheep into the midst of wolves uh, and that they should be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, we have this assumption that innocent as dove means that, you know, we uh, cannot use violence because doves are often used as a, you know, a, a metaphor for peace. And, uh, well, for one thing, Anyone who really knows anything about doves knows that doves are not always peaceful. Okay, well, just, well, just but I don't think, I think that's uh, taking it a little bit out of context here. Uh, but for another thing, in order for us to establish that this is, this is against all use of violence, we first have to establish that all use of violence is a, uh, a, uh, against innocence. Okay, so we first have to establish that we are breaking innocence when we use violence, and that and this scripture here does not say that. Okay, so so that's here. So here we have a word. Okay, innocence. Okay, and we have an idea about innocence, but it's not a biblical idea about innocence. We have a worldly idea of innocence. Innocence, by the world standard, usually means that you just are kind of harmless, not gonna, not gonna really cause any trouble, you know, we're just gonna, you know, kind of, kind of be nice, you know, that's kind of the world's standard of innocence. However, God's standard of innocence is obeying his law. Okay, so instead of taking this word, and again, I'm not trying to say anything bad about my friend here, he, he this is a, this is a good question, but instead of taking this word and taking our our understanding of this word putting it against what we see you know from from our from our experience as um, 
as being good, right, and true, you know, to use violence under certain circumstances to preserve life. Uh, instead of pitting it against that by our understanding of the word, instead we should go back to the biblical understanding. So instead, we need to look at the law, okay? Because innocence is the fulfillment of the law, right? So what does what is the law? Well, summed up in a very brief answer is the law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so this is a case of loving our of do we love our neighbor as ourselves? Because this is this is uh you know this is really goes back to the sixth commandment: you shall not kill when it's actually murder. Okay, so so the question is: is all violence a breaking of the command to love our neighbor as ourselves? Obviously not, because if someone is doing violence to my neighbor and I do no nothing to stop it, that is doing harm to my neighbor. That is that is not loving my neighbor as I should. Okay, so in that case, in that case, we shouldn't. And so that that goes. I guess that goes to show that not all violence is necessarily necessarily wrong not all violence is necessarily a breaking of innocence however much violence is a is wrong is a breaking of innocence for instance the uh the bible says that we are not to avenge ourselves the bible says that we are not to be uh that we are not to uh well we are not to murder which what is murder murder is premeditated uh, killing of another human uh you know we are not to uh negligently kill uh, through our negligence kill another human okay but to uh say that violence all violence is a breaking of innocence is it, it's simply not there it's simply not in the bible because you know in order to fulfill god's law we have to be like god right and god commanded violence in the old testament right the God of the Old Testament is the same God as the God of the New Testament because God never changes, all right? The New Testament did not come to abolish the law. It came to fulfill the law, okay? So so that's why we don't, you know, offer sacrifices uh, or burnt offerings and whatnot. That, that, the New Covenant fulfilled that, okay? We, we're, we're bought and redeemed by Christ. However, we are still required to fulfill the uh, commandments, you know, the Ten Commandments, the, uh, the moral law, you know? So... In that case, you know, I, I believe that the question is really resolved by simply not having this assumption, not not taking our uh, not taking our understanding of a word and applying it to the Bible, but instead taking the Bible's interpretation of that word and uh, using it in context. Okay, so you have that. So we have uh, reading into the, reading our ideas into the Bible instead of applying our, the Bible to our ideas. We have a, you know. Taking, uh, making assumptions about words, and then we have a misuse of context. And I think this is really the biggest one that people fall into. You know, people take a verse and they use it to mean one thing, when really, when you read it in context of the whole chapter, it doesn't mean that at all. You know, judge not whether you, or judge not lest you be judged. You know, it's like, that was used in a sense of, of, we are all under God's, we are all under God's authority, so it's not really my, it's not my place to, uh, to, um, judge my neighbor in a way that I'm putting myself as better than my neighbor. However, it is my responsibility to point out sin where there is sin, because God has called me to hate sin, with, you know, to hate what God hates, okay? So, I'm just saying, there's a lot of different things that can be, that can complicate the scriptures, but usually when you're having a hard time understanding a, a thing in scripture or trying to reconcile a moral with scripture, you should be very suspect that maybe you're trying to read your ideas into scripture into taking and applying scripture's ideas to you. Scripture isn't going to tell you to do anything that's not good for you. Like, like really. Is there anything bad about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And is there anything bad about loving your neighbor as yourself? No. Love does no wrong to a brother. You know, it just, it just doesn't. And when you truly use the Bible in its context, in, it, in its entirety, and apply it to your life instead of applying your life to the Bible, then there really is, it really does create an, a 
It's a beautiful thing, okay? It's a beautiful thing, and it's something that you can live for, something that you can die for, and that's what I... That's what I need. That's something. That's what. That's what draws me to the to, to the God of the Bible. It's it's more than a free ticket to heaven. It's more than just just a a set of morals that now I can live my life by these morals and have an answer to my questions. It's more than that. It's something to live for. It's something to die for. It's a God to live for. A God to die for. A personal God, who, you know, who who cares for me. Who you know who. Who takes away my sin and gives, and in return, in return, I don't know, it, it's not really a fair return, but he, in return he gives me a, a life that's worth living, okay? So, I feel like this was a deep topic. This was a really hard thing for me to uh, get out. Actually, this is take number two of this uh, whole uh, video, and, you know, the, at the end of the day, what I want you to, what, what I want to leave you with is... Don't take my word for it. Get in the Bible and start and study it. Start if, if you if you're having a hard time trusting the inerrancy of Scripture, you have to get into the Bible and start studying it and start testing it. Like the Bible can stand up to any test that you apply to it, so long as you use the Bible in context. You use the whole of the Bible and you use uh, and you don't apply your life to the to the Bible. You apply the Bible to your life. If you do that, then the Bible really can stand up to any test that you throw at it. Okay, so if that's if that's your if that's what you're struggling with, that's what I would advise for that. If you're maybe a Christian, you know, like all the rest of us, who maybe is struggling to come to grips with how you should live your life in light of the Bible, maybe you see some things in the Bible that you just cannot reconcile with things that you know are true, like say. You know, use of force for the defense of uh, to, for the defense of life. Just where something seems like the commandment goes against the commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If ever it seems that way, you might you don't despair because the Bible does not contradict itself. Sometimes it seems like it has it seems like it has contradictions, but usually it's how you're reading it. The Bible never contradicts itself. Okay, it always interprets itself. Itself it explains itself deeper. One verse complements the next verse, okay? But they have to be taken in context, in context of the whole chapter, in context of the whole book, okay? So, that's just why I would encourage you. I would encourage you to trust the inerrancy of the scripture and to understand that, for one, the Bible is not written in a way that cannot be understood, and for two, the Bible is sufficient for all life and godliness. And with that, that's basically what I've got for you guys today. Still no update on the t-shirts. You know, I know you guys are dying to buy my merch. You know, there's only like every YouTuber on YouTube who has merch to sell. Uh, but anyways, I'm still trying to figure out if there's some way I can sell it. I, I know there is eventually a way I can sell it. It's just right now it's not working out. So, I guess that's what I've got for you. And yeah, without any further ado, we'll see you next time.